chapter 23, <clears throat> and the Lord is about to be crucified here. And it says this in verse 33, And when they were come to a place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, uh, and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. If you believe in a hill called Mount Calvary, if you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on a hill called Calvary, which I believe, you believe? That is the only reason you believe it. You say, oh, no, preacher, I, no, no. That is the one single only reason you believe in Calvary because that is the one only single time the word Calvary appears in Scripture. The word Calvary does not appear two times in Scripture. It only appears in that one verse. Then you might say, well, well wait a minute, preacher. Uh, my pastor preached out of John 19 talking about the crucifixion, uh, and he talked about Calvary. Well, yeah, he can do that. Yeah, because he's talking about the crucifixion. But you won't find the word Calvary in John chapter 19. And so if you believe, you say, well, oh, well, preacher, preacher, uh, look here, look at uh, 352, uh, top of the second line, uh, first, uh, uh, second, verse, second line of the first verse, uh, and paid the price of all my, uh, all my sins at Calvary. Uh, look at uh, 353, first line, uh, first, uh, line of the second uh, stanza, uh, love brought my Savior here to die on Calvary. Um, 354, look to the Lamb of God, uh, first stanza, second line, he to redeem you died on Calvary. You say, well, that's it, preacher. See, I believe in Calvary because, because we talk about Calvary in our hymnal. You saw three references to Calvary, correct? Every one of them only, how do you think they got there? They got there from Luke chapter 23, verse 33. <laughs> Every reference to Calvary uh, in a New Testament or, or, or in, a, in a hymnal came from Luke chapter 23, verse 33, because that's the only time it appeared in the Bible. And I, I told you that because I just want to let you know <clears throat> that there is no place called Calvary and never was. There never was a hill called Calvary. If you have an NIV or a New American Standard Version or just about any other modern translation because the word Calvary is not found in the modern translations. It says skull, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, hang on a second paid the price for all my sins on skull. <laughs> this has a nice ring to it. Um, love, love brought my Savior here to die on skull. How about I've been to skull? <laughs> well, here's what I believe, guys. I believe if you use a modern translation, you ought to be completely honest. If the King James Bible is so bad and you get a Bible that doesn't have Calvary in it, then be honest enough to go through your hymnal. I mean, look. These guys think nothing of scratching a word out of the Bible, right? Then scratching one out of a hymnal shouldn't be sacrilegious to them. I think they ought to scratch Calvary out of every hymn, get rid of that nasty old King James Bible word about a hill that never existed, and put in skull. Uh, I, was, uh, I was with a pastor in Ohio, and um, we drove past a church called Calvary Baptist Church. That's a pretty popular name for Baptist churches, right? Okay. I preach a lot of Calvary Baptist churches. Uh, and, and the pastor says, uh, Brother Gip, he said, this is Calvary Baptist Church. And he said, the pastor just got rid of the, New King ja or got rid of the King James, and the official Bible of that church is the New International Version. And he thought I would be like, oh, dirty. And I started laughing. He says, what are you laughing about? I said, I said, listen. I said, first off, to get that King James out of his people's hands and minds and hearts, he had to say some bad things about it, tell them it was out of date and blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah. And I said, so now he's got him using the NIV, right? Yeah. Because the King James is no good, right? Yeah. And I said, he can't find the name of his church in the Bible that he's using. He's got to go back to the nasty old 1611 King James Bible to find the name of his church, Calvary. And I said, why I'm laughing is, I get to be there at the judgment seat of Christ when he explains that to the Lord. I think that's going to be pretty funny. Uh, I think you should scratch out Calvary Baptist Church and call it Skull. Baptist Church, which scary as it is, uh, this this uh, your pastor does this thing on emergent churches, uh, and there's a whole raft of those called Skull Church. I'm up in Billings, Montana, and it says the Skull Church. Yeah, I, you know, I think that I'll feel a little teeth like this. You don't want to be there for the Lord's Supper. All right, all right. Uh, first, we're going to look at the Geneva, um, and whoops, and. and um, 
the Geneva Bible, uh, this book here, uh, this says the 2006 Geneva Bible, the Trojan horse. Trojan horse. Uh, why? Well, you know what the Trojan horse was. They brought it in. Why? Because they thought it was safe. And once it was inside, it destroyed them. I heard a King James Bible-believing pastor. I mean, as King James as I am, as King James your pastor. Uh, and he said, well, I've been studying out of the Geneva. Uh, why? And here's the amazing thing. We had guys that are studying out of the Geneva that would never study out of the NIV. And they've got this concept or misconcept uh, that the Geneva, because it was before the King James, is better than the King James. Uh, and I'm going to tell you some of the problems. First off, uh, the proponents of this book are Calvinists. Uh, the Geneva was the Bible of the Puritans. Puritans were Calvinists. If you get a Geneva, uh, it says 1599. I say, I say 2006 because, guys, all you got to do is read the introduction of a book. And if you get the 1599 Geneva Bible and read the introduction, it says this is a copy uh, of a uh, uh, 2006 update of the 1599. But they knew if they put the 2006 Geneva Bible on their cover, nobody would want to buy it. So they put 1599. You say, is that deceitful? Like I told you guys, if you can't get past the cover without being deceived, what do you think you're going to get inside? And so um, I, I hear these guys, you know, they all, they all go, uh, well, the Geneva Bible, you know, that preceded the King James Bible, and, and, and uh, that wasn't the Bible of the Anglicans, that was the Bible of the Puritans. You know what I tell those guys as soon as they say that? In 1603, do you know why you have a King James Bible? Because in 1603, uh, King James uh, came to the throne. And in 1604, he was met by Anglicans and Puritans. And they got together at Hampton Court, and both sides said, we want a new translation. So when you say, I want the 1599 Geneva, and talk about how it was the Bible of the Puritans, you want the Bible that the Puritans of 1599 had already rejected. <laughs> They rejected it in 1604 when they said, we want a, a new Bible. And the one they used was the, was the King James. So uh, it, it is, you know, don't let them fool you uh, into thinking that, that they wanted it. They didn't want it. Uh, here's what they say. They say the Geneva Bible was the Bible of the pilgrims in 1620. Absolutely. Yes, it was. The pilgrims were Puritans. Their Bible was the Geneva. Uh, and these guys make much of that. You know, when they came off the Mayflower, they didn't have a King James Bible in their hand. They had a Geneva. Absolutely, that's true. Then they lie. And they say, and the Geneva is the Bible that America was founded on. Now, that's a lie. That's a deception. You say, how do you know? Do you know when the last Geneva Bible was printed? The, the very first Geneva Bible, uh, the New Testament was done in 1557. Whole Bible... Uh, in 1560, and it was in print until 1644. There were no Geneva Bibles printed after 1644. When did we sign our Declaration of Independence? Not a trick question. <laughs> did anybody here know that we did that? <laughs> Somebody say it. 1776. No, that wasn't it, was it? Oh, anyway. Yeah, 1776. Oops, get that one in there. You know what that means? In 1776, when we signed our Declaration of Independence from England, the newest Geneva Bible on the planet was 132 years old. The last one, the last time a Geneva was printed was 132 years earlier. Now, you really think everybody in the colonies run around 132-year-old Bibles under their hand? And that's if they had the newest one. So, guys... The Geneva was the Bible of the Puritans, the pilgrims. It was not the Bible that our country was founded on. The King James Bible is the Bible our country is founded on. And don't let somebody deceive you with that kind of stuff. Now, uh, I told you I just read it one time, and, and most of the stuff is in, uh, uh, is in this book. Here's some problems in the, in the uh, introduction of this 1599. It was written by a bunch of these Calvinists. And here's the footnotes. Now, here's some of the footnotes from the, from the, the real 1599 Jeho uh, Geneva. Uh, and these are all anti-Roman Catholic. Uh, in in um, the footnote for Revelation 1311, it says, The second beast is said to come out of Rome. Uh, the footnote for 1312 
Uh, the footnote identifies the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope as the religion and person of the Antichrist. You guys believe that, don't you? Man, you guys are not enthusiastic at all. Let's go back to talking about the ball tickets. Maybe that'll get you excited. Uh, well, it is. Um, in 1318, the, the footnote says, the number of the beast, 666, is ascribed to the Pope. Uh, also, in that, there's a footnote there. It says, this footnote refers to that cruel beast, Boniface VIII, who was the Pope at that time. They're calling the Pope at that time the beast. Somewhat anti-Roman Catholic. Uh, the color of the beast, scarlet and purple, are ascribed to the Roman clergy. That's in Revelation, the footnote for Revelation 17.3. Uh, the footnote for 17.4, that harlot, the spiritual Babylon, which is Rome. I mean, they were laying out exactly what you, we, you and I believe. Isn't that true? Um, Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, the footnote there says, this footnote points out that the beast is, quote, the empire of Rome, unquote. Uh, the footnote for, for Revelation 17.9 now that woman that sitteth upon seven hills is the city of Rome. Uh, footnote for 17.9, the seven kings are identified as seven Roman empire, uh, emperors. Uh, for 17.18, uh, Revelation 17.18, the footnote says that city, Rome, that great city, uh, or, or the only city, uh, the king and head thereof was the emperor, emperor, but now the pope. So you've got ten footnotes that plainly plainly point to the Roman Catholic Church as the church of the Antichrist and the Pope as being the Antichrist. Guys, is that what we believe? But how are you going to sell that in the 20th century? Or 21st century? So here's what, um, uh, this is Gary D. DeMar on the advisory board. Here's what he wrote. The Geneva study notes contain some outspokenly anti-Roman Catholic content. Yeah, I would say it's pretty outspoken. Uh, as one might expect, considering that Rome was still persecuting Protestants during its development. Keep in mind that the English translators were exiles uh, from, from England's Queen Bloody Mary, who was burning Protestants at the stake while returning her nation to the Roman Catholic faith. Uh, in the fourth paragraph, he says this, Like many modern-day study Bibles, uh, the scholars who developed the notes on prophetic texts for the Geneva Bible wrote them, with current events in mind, both religious and political. So what he's saying is that they were influenced by the political events that were going on right at that time, which was the burning of Protestants. Listen to this. Tell me if you can say amen to this. Humble, our, our humble prayer is that the Roman Catholic Church will continue to reform by conforming her doctrine and practice to the, uh, the authority of the Scripture. We believe this will happen one day. Guys, that, that is a little bit of hokum. Um, for your information, I think last week your pastor was preaching. Uh, and uh, didn't you have the message on backsliding? Yeah. yeah. Well, he talked about backsliding. And he didn't know it at the time, but he is really glad he had a King James Bible. Because backslide, backslider, backsliding appears nowhere in the Geneva. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's quoted as, where, where the word backsliding or backslidings <clears throat> appears in the, in the Bible, uh, it, it's written as the heart that declineth, the turning back, the rebel, rebellious Israel, rebellious Israel, disobedient Israel, disobedient children, disobedient children, rebellions, 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 rebellious daughter, rebellious daughter, uh, rebellious, rebellion, and rebellions. There's no backsliding uh, in a Geneva. That may be why some of these guys want it. Uh, what about a propitiation? Propitiation is, is really, it's kind of like the unloading of the gun of God's anger. Now, one of the things that I uh, want to do in this book is I compare scripture in a Wycliffe, which would be uh, 1380, uh, Tyndale, a Cramner, a Great Bible, and then I have, I have a Geneva 1557, that's the first year. I also have a Geneva 1560, and then I have this 1599. So we're not talking about different uh, uh, translations. We're talking about three editions or revisions of the same translation. Um, in, the, um, in, in Romans 325, 
the 1557, instead of saying propitiation, says pacification. But three years later, they took that word out and inserted reconciliation. And then the 1599 says reconciliation. Now, here's one of the things that I noticed as I read this, uh, this Geneva. From addition to addition, there were major changes. That's a major change. Okay? We're not talking about a spelling change. We're not talking about change in the spelling. We're talking about a different word with a different meaning in three editions of the very same translation. And that happens time uh, and time again. Uh, in uh, 1 John 4.10, where propitiation appears, uh, in the 1557 it says, Make agreement for our sins. In the 1560 and the 1599, it says again, reconciliation. Um, in the 1557, in 1 John 2.2, 2, 2, uh, in the 1557, instead of propitiation, it says, Obtaineth grace. And in the 1560, three years later, and in the 1599, it says, Reconciliation. Um, here's an interesting thing. Luke chapter 15, in the 1557, Luke chapter 15 has 32 verses. In the 1560, it has 31 verses. And in the uh, 1599, it has 31 verses. Now, guys, you're not going to pick up a King James Bible uh, and, and from edition to edition. And there's no revisions. I said edition. Uh, from edition to edition, you're not going to find the numbers of verses changing uh, from verse to verse. Uh, go with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And this is kind of, uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to look at it, it's kind of doubly amazing. In Genesis chapter uh, 22, this is where, <clears throat> this is where God tells uh, Abraham to offer Isaac, his son, uh, up on Mount Moriah. And they're headed up there, and the kid, you know, he's got a little bit of sense. I mean, he sees the wood, he sees the, the fire, he don't see a lamb. And he's thinking, ooh, I wonder if the old man's going to do what he's been threatening to do all these years. And so it says this in verse 7, And Isaac <clears throat> spake unto, unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. All right? God will provide himself a a lamb. Now you say, well, that means that God's going to provide the lamb. Yeah, but look at the wording. God will provide himself a lamb. That is a prophetic reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how you know that? Because in chapter 22, they never got a lamb. They got a ram. The lamb didn't show up for uh, almost 2,000 more years. John identified him for you. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now, hmm. Um, this is interesting. In the NIV, it says God himself will provide a lamb. Well, God himself would provide the lamb, but it, you've lost the, prof the prophecy, correct? The New American Standard Version says God will provide for himself a lamb. Well, I, I don't mean to, 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 to uh, pick, but he didn't need the lamb. You need the lamb, okay? Uh, the um, New King James, and here's what you'll find, just a rule of thumb, the New King James, you know how they, uh, listen, your King James Bible uh, the translator said in the dedication, they said, uh, we didn't want a new translation. We just want to make a good translation better. The New King James stole that. And that's what they, 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 they quote that. 
uh, when they talk about the New King James. We're just trying to make a good one better. We're taking the 1611 and making it better. Well, here's what they really did. They took, they took the 1611 and made it read like the New, New American Standard because just about every time the New King James makes a change, it doesn't go along with the NIV. It goes along with the New uh, American Standard. So for that reason, the New King James reads just like the New, uh, reads just like the new, um, new American Standard. Let me see if I can find this. Because I didn't write down the page. Maybe it's not in here. Ah, here it is. The Geneva says, my son, God will provide him a lamb. But again, you don't have the prophecy. Do you understand? And... <coughs> So there's two reasons why I want to point that out to you. Number one, uh, the King James Bible is the only one that has the prophecy. Right? But you know what's really neat? The Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew that the King James comes from is the same Hebrew that the Geneva comes from. Pretty much the same Hebrew that the New, New King James, the New American Standard, and the IV. The Hebrew reads the same. We got that prophecy through the translation into English. I always tell people, somebody says, you think the King James is inspired? I, I don't know if that's inspiration, but that'll do till we can find it. All right? So your, your Geneva loses uh, a, um, um, a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. Now, this is a neat one. Uh, open your Bibles to um, Numbers chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. And this is when uh, Balak has tried to get Balaam to come and curse Israel. And, and instead, he, he blesses them. And here's what it says in verse 21. Uh, Numbers 23, 21 in the King James Bible, talking about God. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Okay. So he says he has, he's not beheld iniquity, neither seen perverseness, right? All right, does anybody know what a double negative is? All right, it's like, um, I wouldn't not ever lie. Uh, Obama wouldn't not ever lie. Anyway, a double negative is a positive. <laughs> if I say we're not going to leave here, we're not going to leave here. If I say... We, we are not going to not leave here. I just said we're going to leave here. Here's what the Geneva says. It has a double negative. He seeth none iniquity in Jacob, nor seeth no transgression, no transgression in Israel. <laughs> nor seeth no transgression. Then he just said he sees transgression in Israel. Right? And that is the exact opposite of what the verse says. And that is the Geneva, and that is one of its uh, shortcomings and mistakes. Uh, how many of you ever heard this? In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse, well, look at it. 2 Samuel uh, 21. In 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 19, we are very critical of the NIV because of what it does to this verse. Look at verse 19. And there was again a battle in Gob. Uh, with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeroboam, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. You notice the brother of is in italics. Uh, the NIV takes a, that phrase out, the brother of, which, it, which the NIV has Elhanan killing Goliath. You say that makes a contradiction. No, that makes two contradictions. 
It makes a contradiction with 1 Samuel 17 that says David killed Goliath. But it also makes a, a contradiction with 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5, which is the parallel to this chapter, this verse, where it says, Elhanan killed the brother of Goliath, and the brother of is not in italics. Now, we are very critical of the NIV for doing that, correct? It was just following the Geneva. The Geneva has that mistake in it. Um, how many, uh, Psalm 23, the very last verse, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Well, are you going to? You going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? I am. Not with Geneva. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for a long season. <laughs> I got news for you, bucko. My ticket isn't running out. Okay? I'm not going to go to heaven. They're going, well, you've been here pretty long. Well, would it, wouldn't it be something if, if God had a sense of humor? Well, he does have a sense of humor. Maybe after about, uh, about 400 years, he'll walk up to one of the Geneva translators and go, uh, hey, how you liking up here? Oh, great, great. Well, you've been here quite a while, haven't you? Mm, yeah, you've been here quite a long season, haven't you? Um, Psalm 128, uh, 138, 130, you don't have to go there. Uh, 138 verse 2 where it says, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the Geneva, Thou hast magnified thy name above all things by thy word. And you just lost a reference uh, that exalts the Bible, correct? Thou hast magnified thy name above all things by thy word. Um, I, like the, <laughs> I like this one. Uh, Malachi chapter 2 verse 16, where it says, God hateth putting away. The Geneva says, if thou hatest her, put her away. I know, I, know there's, I know there's supposed to be something wrong with that. Actually, that Geneva's not too bad. Um, John chapter 1 and verse 3. All things were made by him, and by him uh, was not anything made that was made. Correct? Here's what the Geneva says. All things were made by it, and without it was made nothing that was made. Calling the creator an it. Um, Hebrews chapter 10. Oh, could you believe a comma could keep Jesus Christ from coming back to set up his throne? A comma. Uh, look, at, uh, look at Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, This isn't the verse I want you to look at, but it's just a good one for, uh, for Roman Catholics. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. Now watch verse 12. But this man, after he'd offered uh, one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, sat down on the right hand of God. Okay? So after he made the, the one sacrifice for sins forever, comma, he sat down at the right hand of God. Correct? Here's where... Here's where um, but Geneva puts that comma. But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, sitteth forever at the right hand of God. They just planted him there, and he's never getting back out. He's, is he sitting forever? No, he's got, he's got to get up come back down here, doesn't he? But a Geneva doesn't have him coming back. Um, and then... Um, here is uh, a real bad one, very bad. The word repent, repented, and repentance is removed several places, like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 20, 14 times, 14 times in the Geneva. And, and it's, here's what it says, where the, where the King James Bible says repent, repented, or repentance, the Geneva... Uh, in Matthew 3, verse 8, says, do penance. Uh, Matthew 3, 11, do penance. Matthew 4, 17, do penance. Mark 1, 4, of penance. 
Mark 6, 6, 12, do penance. Uh, Luke 3, uh, 3, 8, of penance. Uh, Anybody here was a Roman Catholic? Okay, you know what penance is, isn't it? Man, you go in this phone booth with this guy dressed like mother calls himself father, and you're supposed to tell him everything you've been doing all week. And I, all the guys I knew, we never told him the truth. Man, you ain't going to tell that guy something. I told that guy tr- truth one time. And you know what he did? He lifted the curtain to see who it was. And I thought, never again. In fact, you know what I thought about doing? I thought about getting a, a Halloween mask. <laughs> and really lay out some sins, and then quick put it on. And when he, and when he went like this, I was going, <laughs> But then I'd have had to confess that too, and I'd still be praying. But, uh, but here's what they say. They say, do, a, do penance, which means you got to say, um, you know, they'll say, say an act of contrition and uh, 100 Hail, our fathers, 100 Hail Marys. You guys may not know this, but Roman Catholics invented speaking in tongues. They did. Because nobody, when you got to say 50 Hail Marys, nobody says, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. You go, Hail Mary, full of grace, Holy Mother, Holy Mother God, pray for the Hail Mary, full of grace, Holy Mother, Holy Mother, God, pray for the You say, oh, you're exaggerating. Walk in a Catholic church on Saturday and see if that ain't what you hear. Luke 13, 3, have penance. Luke 13, 5, do not penance. Uh, Luke 15, 7, doing penance. Uh, here's a strange one. Luke 16, 30. Um, in the Geneva 15, 57, it says, convert to God. And in the others, it says, do penance. Uh, Acts 2.38, do ye penance. Uh, Acts Acts, uh, 3.19, in the 1557, it says, repent. But in the 1560 and 1599, it says, uh, do penance. Uh, Acts 26, verse 20, do penance. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, do penance. So you got 10 references where, where people are told to do something that the Roman Catholic Church teaches them to do. So guys, the reason I want to show you that is because don't let, uh, don't let this thing, and I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what gets into people's hearts. One thing, pride. Uh, and reading the Geneva, it did, it did make me change one thing radically. It seemed like such a small thing. But prior to that, prior to reading that, I used to draw a timeline uh, of Bible versions, uh, and it would kind of go like this. um, And you'd have uh, you'd have the Tyndale, and you'd have the um, uh, Coverdale, uh, and you'd have the um, Matthews. And you'd have the Great Bible, and you'd have the the uh, Geneva Bible, and you have the Bishop's Bible, and then you'd have the King James Bible, and then in uh, 1881 you got the uh, Revised Version. And in 1901, you got the American Standard Version. And in 1952, you got the uh, Revised Standard Version. 1960, I think 60, 63, you got the New, new American Standard Version. Uh, in in um, 1973, you got the New International Version. 1982, you got the New King James Version. I used to draw that. I never draw that anymore. You know how I draw it now? You got the Tyndale and the Coverdale and the Matthews and the Great and the Geneva and the Bishops. None of these were perfect. They're not on evil, uh, on, on equal ground with the King James Bible. In these, they were headed up. And after that, they were headed down. Now, 
Uh, did, did we talk about why did God use the King James and not an earlier translation? Okay, I get that question. Probably somebody's going to ask it tomorrow, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just answer it now. Uh, I have a lot of guys say, you know, why, why not one of these? Uh, and I, I told you, I cannot answer for God. Um, but there's two things that, that I am aware of that, that the King James Bible has unique about it. First off, prior to, um, to 1611, actually to right around the, the beginning of that century, the 17th century, English was still a fluid language. There were still some pronoun things that were not completely solidified. Uh, now, the spelling wasn't, wasn't uh, and capitalization wasn't actually uh, solidified for years, but the language itself. Guys, the, the King James English is not Old English. It is modern English. If you saw Old English, you couldn't read it. If you saw Middle English, you might recognize a word or two, but you couldn't read it. And so the King James Bible is, is actually one of the first versions in modern English. And so prior to this, English, the language, was not solidified, but by 1600, it was. All right? But then there's something else. I'm not saying this is why God did it, why he used the King James. I'm saying this is what I observe. Every Bible prior to the King James was either a one-man translation or a one-group translation. Uh, by one man, this was Tyndale, one man. Coverdale, one man. Matthews, one man. Uh, the great the great was for one group. Gen uh, the, the Geneva was for the, uh, uh, the um, Puritans. The bishops was for the Anglican church. And so every Bible prior to 1611 was either one man or one group. The King James Bible, it's called the King James Bible, but he didn't translate it. It wasn't translated by one man. It's translated by 47 different guys. Uh, and it was not one group. You know who translated it? The Anglicans and the Puritans. That's like saying the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about this, but some of those Anglicans would have rather burned their fellow translators at the stake than translate a Bible with them. But the Anglicans made it not a Puritan Bible, and the Puritans made it not an Anglican Bible. I am not saying that's why God did the King James. Uh, I am just saying, or chose King James, chose to use it. I'm just saying that's what I notice about that. Now, I did have a guy tell me one time, you know, he was trying to be reasonable, and I wasn't. I wasn't reasonable. Uh, and, um, and he said, well, you know, I, I would like to believe the King James, which means he wouldn't. And he said, um, but you know, you had all these translations prior to King James. Why? Why the King James? I just can't. I could, if you said the first English translation, I could live with it. But why would you go past all of these why the King James? He said, I just can't. I, I, I said, well, you just, I said, that's kind of ridiculous, huh? You just can't put your faith that it would be. It's almost like, it's almost like we did this up here, got over here, threw a dart to pick the Bible, and it just happened to hit the King James. If it hit the Geneva, that's what we'd be using. And I said, um, I said, you just, you just can't put your faith in something that that's, it is that ridiculous, right? He said, well, yes, it's just ridiculous to believe that it would be the King James Bible. And I said, you can't believe anything ridiculous, right? He said, right. I said, and you think that you're going to fly through the air without an airplane to the sound of a trumpet, right? Uh, yeah. Could we describe that with one word? <laughs> ridiculous. Come on, guys. Go to somebody lost tomorrow and say, guess what? One of these days, there's going to be a trumpet sound, and I'm going to fly through the air without an airplane. And, and if they call ridiculous, if that's all they say, you got off light. <laughs> I said, um, you believe somebody at one time walked on top of water, right? Yeah. yeah. Kind of ridiculous. You think somebody walked up to a dead body and told it to come up and it went home with its mom, right? Kind of ridiculous. Don't you think it's ridiculous? I'll tell you one that's ridiculous. I said, you think some guy died 2,000 years ago and somehow paid for the sins of somebody that wasn't even a thought. And that he came back to life three days and three nights later. And that here, 2,000 years removed from that, all you've got to do is take that death, burial, and resurrection as the payment for your sin, and you can go to heaven. He said, yeah. I said, that is ridiculous. So guys, I want you to know something. I believe the King James Bible is the absolute perfect word of God. And yes, it is ridiculous. But it is weighed down 
on a long list of ridiculous things that I believe. Really? I mean, guys, if you, if you can get past the rapture, the issue of the King James Bible should be small potatoes. All right, now that's the, that is the Geneva. Uh, there's more in the book. Uh, we only have that one. So like I said, it's $1,000. But, um, but I want to give you the new King James. <clears throat> because even in our churches, nobody will say it, but even in our churches, uh, here's what you think. Well... Uh, I, I think it's, I, I, you know, I can't use the New King James, but it's probably just the King James Bible without the these and the thous. I'll tell you what it is. It's the, it's the Bible without the Word of God. That's what it is. Now, we're going to look at it in, in, uh, in several different ways. Um, you have heard this. We, we referred to it. You have heard that, that uh, all of them say, all translations say, the King James Bible is hard to read and ours is easier to read. Correct. And that is one of the things that the New King James came out. In fact, has anybody here, I have both. Uh, does anybody here have the, uh, uh, the facsimile, the 1611 facsimile was printed in 1982? It looks about the size of your hymnal, about the color of your hymnal. All right. It was printed in 1982 by Thomas Nelson Publishers. Uh, after Thomas Nelson got what they wanted from it, and I'll explain that in a minute, they sold the plates to Hendrickson. So if you've got one printed by Hendrickson, that's the old uh, Thomas Nelson. And let me tell you what, uh, why, why they did that. When they printed this, um, when they printed this King James uh, facsimile, uh, they, they printed a 1611 facsimile, and they printed it in 1982. Does anybody know what modern translation came out in 1982? I mentioned it. New King James Version. And here's why they did this. And this is exactly why. By, by the way, Thomas Nelson printed that, that facsimile, and they also printed the New King James. And what they taught them to do at bookstores is they said, if somebody comes in and says, now, now I'm going to tell you, I was, tell, I was telling Miriam, I said, if you guys want to argue, go to any bookstore and say, I want to buy a new Bible. Talk to a salesman, I want a new Bible. Okay. Uh, well, I got all kinds of versions. No, I want a King James. If you say, I want an ESV, he'll walk right over the shelf and get you an ESV. If you say, I want a living Bible, a new King James, he'll walk right over uh, and give it to you. But if you say King James, he will do anything to get you to buy something else. This is the, this is the Thomas Nelson. All right, this is the original. So this happened. I remember I told you I will not make up their offenses in 1982, I was uh, pastoring in upstate New York. A lady in my church went to, to Syracuse, because about the equivalent of being here and going to uh, Minneapolis. Uh, she went over to Syracuse to a Bible bookstore and said, I want a King James Bible. I want a new Bible. I want a King James Bible. And the kid says, no, you don't. It's hard to read. And um, she said, no, I want a King James Bible. 1611 King James Bible. No, 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 you want this. And told her to get an NIV, blah, blah, blah. And he told her the, the new King James was the King James without these and thous. She said, I want a 1611 King James Bible. And he went and took this off the shelf. Now, if you saw this, it's, uh, well, this one is actually in Roman type, but it was in Gothic type, the 1611. And, and the spelling is different. Son is spelled S-O-N-N-E. Evil is E-U-I-L-L. -L. And he, he handed this to her. And, and arrogantly said, can you read that? And she couldn't read it. And he said, well, if you insist I sell you a King James, I've got to sell you that. And she left that bookstore crying that day. And he wasn't there when I went over, or he'd have left that bookstore crying that day. <laughs> I hunted him. He wasn't there. I never did find the guy. But that's why Thomas Nelson did this. They weren't doing us a favor. They were doing themselves a favor. They put this out and the New King James at the same time and said, if somebody wants a King James, tell them that's, look at this, 1611, King James Version. That's what you want, right? Can you read that? No, I can't. Well, look at this. This is the same thing without the these and thous. It's called the New King James Version. It was a sales ploy. Underhanded, unscrupulous, typical Christian. So, um, so that's, why, that's why they did that. All right, that's why they brought out that... Um, that um, 
reproduction of the 1611. But in spite of that, we've still got some people that believe that the King James, the New King James, is the King James without the these and thous and probably easier to read. So let's do this. Here's the reference. Here's the AV. And here's the New King James. In, um, oh, by the way, by the way, got this. Just a second. Yes, yes. Back on the table, we have, uh, we have four tracks. They're four for a dollar. Uh, this is the, the information I'm giving you now, almost 99% uh, of it is in this track. I have read the New King James Version four times cover to cover. Not because I think it's Word of God, but because um, this blue book, this blue book, and you've seen others, and, and they have kind of a scripture list. <clears throat> and if you say, well, if you want to know if it's a good Bible, check this verse and this verse and this verse. And that verse will be changed in the NIV. It'll be changed in the American Standard. Uh, it'll be changed in the English Standard. It'll be changed in the Living Bible. And the list, the checklist of, of Scripture that we have to check against uh, uh, new versions, the New King James translators had it on the table and didn't change the verses. So that you go there and you go, well, look, it's reading right. So it must be okay. Consequently, I had to read the thing four times to find what's really wrong with it. Example. I, and what I say is that it just took some things that were easy to understand and made them difficult. Uh, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 1, in your Bible it says that um, Abraham dwelt in the plains. Well, that's no pun intended, pretty plain. But the New King James said he dwelt in the terebinth trees. So apparently he was a, he was a monkey. Um, in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 4, it talks about an oak. You all know what an oak is. Sure, it's a terebinth tree. Uh, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible refers to dung. We won't be graphic, but you know what that is. Well, the New King James took that out and put in offal. I think this is just offal. Um, Judges chapter 8 and verse 13. I'll give it to you. The New King James says, the ascent of Harry's. You remember reading that in your King James Bible? Well, that's because here's what you read in the King James Bible. The sun was up. Think there's a little difference there? I'd say that's not taking the these and thous out of the King James Bible. Second um, Samuel chapter 6 and verse 5. Let me ask you, does anybody here know what a cistern is? I, I didn't say cistern that you catch water in. I said a cistern. Does anybody know what a cistern is? I'll bet you everybody here knows what a cistern is. I'll bet every one of you know what a cistern is. See, that's the New King James word for the King James word Cornet. Now you know what a cornet is, don't you? Dodge build about 1967. If you got a Hemi with the 727 uh, transmission, you had a good car. Anyway, um, 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 2. <clears throat> uh, do you know what a retinue is? Now this is not part of your eye, okay? Retinue. You all know what a retinue is. A uh, bunch of you girls are interested in the retinue. Yeah. When, um, when Princess Di got married, you know, now they call her Princess Di. But um, when Princess Di got married, the veil that she had was 35 feet long behind her. It was a 35 foot long train. 
So her train, that's what he even said, her train was 35 feet long, uh, and they said retinue. Now, here's what I want you to do, okay? Because I hate to say this, but, but it is in us sometimes to, to, to be the devil's advocate. I hate that term. I, don't ever, don't you ever say, let me be the devil's advocate. What I've found that when most people say, I want to be the devil's advocate, they want to be the devil. That's what they want. They want to be the devil. Why would you dare want to give the devil's side of an argument? And, and you'll have somebody saying, well, I can understand, you know, sister, I'm in cornet. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine you're talking to a nine-year-old and see which one of these he understands. Because if it's easier to read, then shouldn't it be easier for younger people to understand? They don't understand that. Um, oh, they might understand this one. Yep, yep, they sure do. Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 14. The kid comes in, running into his parents' bedroom and said, There's a night creature in my room. I heard a night creature outside. And his dad said, Don't worry, kid. I got a King James Bible. It's just a screech owl. Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, verse 2. Does anybody know what a set trap is? Now, I'm not talking about anything that has to do with golf. You know what a sat trap is? You all know what a sat trap is. Everybody, every one of you know what a sat trap is. How can the New King James be easier to read when you don't even know what the words they're using mean? Because here's what a sat trap is. Prince. Guys, that's why you want an English Bible from England. You know where they have Satrap Charles. Now, uh, what I'm going we'll to we'll give you over here is similar to this, but this is, this is strictly, pretty, pretty strictly, where almost every time the New King James took a single-syllable word out <clears throat> and replaced it with a multi-syllable word. Uh, in uh, Genesis, and by the way, you don't have to write these notes down. If you're not too cheap to spend a buck, you can get all four tracks. Genesis chapter 9, verse 9, talks about seed. The New King James... Changes that to D Sen Dense. So you went from one syllable to three syllables. No honest person can say somehow that is easier to read. Um, 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. The King James Bible says evil. The New King James says dis, stress, ing. Now, you can, I looked in the dictionary and it says that evil can be considered one syllable or two. But even if it's two syllables, a kid knows what evil is. I, I, to do this, I looked up in the dictionary. The word evil had no, it had no, it had no definition for evil at all. It just had a picture of Obama. Anyway, um, <clears throat> how's this one? Second Kings, chapter 12 and verse 5. The King James Bible says breach. Um, well, if they're going to... Uh, a breach, like a break in the wall. Uh, many times when they, when they attacked a city, uh, they needed to put a breach in the wall, and then they, they, they poured in through the breach. Uh, it, one of the amazing things about that is that is one, two, three, four, five, six letters. It's still one syllable. The New King James said D, lap, I, de, shuns. So you went from one syllable to one, two, three, four, Five syllables. 
Talk to a kid about a breach. Talk to a kid about dilapidations. He'll understand breach. Um, Acts chapter 10 and verse 1. Remember it said that Cornelius was of the Italian band? Well, New King James says he's of the Italian regiment. So you just went from one syllable to three syllables. Um, let me ask you this. Who knows what certisans are? You know what certisans are? We used to drive by certisans when I was a kid. Scared me to death. You guys know what certisans are? You better not get a new King James. You need something that's harder to read, like the King James, where it says quicksands. I'll bet you've had dreams about Surtis Sands. I got stuck in the Surtis Sands. I was fishing. I was fishing. I used to fish one day a year with uh, Dennis Coral, and um, and he was crossing this little creek, and he got into quicksand. He goes, "Yep, I'm in quicksand." Well, man, you got to act fast. I said, "Quick, throw me your watch." <laughs> figured he wouldn't need it in half an hour. <clears throat> anyway, and this one, this one I love. I, I love it. It talks about the children of an elder or a, or a bishop or a pastor, and they should not be guilty or accused of riot and unruly. Now, is there anybody here that doesn't understand what riot and unruly are? You all understand what a riot is. You all understand what unruly is, right? Well, somehow those two words have um, stunt, stunted your growth. So, in place of riot, the New King James says dissipation and unruly insubordination. All right, I'm going to give you three syllables for unruly, but a kid knows what unruly is, right? I mean, now it says uh, that the, the child of a children of a of a bishop are not to be guilty of accused of riot and unruly, and in New King James, it says they're not to be accused of dissipation and insubordination. So I guess we're not going to spank them anymore. We're going to court martial them. I don't even know what dissipation is, but every time I see that, I want to take Pepto Bismol. Now, that is, uh, that is not all of the problems uh, of the New King James. Um, the New King James, have you ever heard uh, when they talk about a modern translation being gender inclusive? Now, you, you know they're lying. Look, if I, if I throw you guys out of this room, have I included you? I have excluded you, Right? So if you take gender out of a Bible, you're not including gender, you're taking it out, right? And the NIV makes much of being gender exclusive. I, I say it's exclusive because it takes gender out. Uh, and it makes much of being gender exclusive. And my intention was to read the New King James three times. And when I was reading th the third time, I started to notice something that required a whole fourth read. And that is this. The New King James Version is more, gen more gender exclusive than the NIV. And in this track, that list right there is just, I think, 42 or 43 times gender has been removed just from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. Um, in uh, chapter 1, verse 26, King James says, wise men, and I, uh, New King James, wise Man's wisdom, human wisdom. Uh, every time it says no man, the New King James says no one. Every man, each one. Any man, any one. Every man, each one. Man's judgment, human court. Um, one of men, that's just deleted. Sons is changed to children. And here's, here's where I can prove that it is more 
gender exclusive than the NIV. Now, they may have altered the NIV now, but um, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36, it talks about a woman being past the flower of her age. And the New King James takes flower of her age out and puts of youth. The, new, the, the NIV doesn't take the female gender out. It's only prejudiced against men. So it isn't as gender exclusive as the New King James. You say, well, I never heard that about the New King James. That's because the NIV is marketed to liberals. And liberals make a big deal about gender exclusion. But the New King James was marketed to conservatives. It's aimed at you. And if they talk about taking gender out, you're not going to want it. So they did it. They just never told you. And then, and then there's uh, this. Uh, look in your Bible at, um, at Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. And in Zechariah chapter 13, the Bible says in verse 6, a prophetic reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It says, and one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? All right? So it says, what are these wounds in thine hands? That is plainly a prophetic reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, correct? Amen. All right. The, the, remember I told you the New King James came out in 1982? Well, here's what they didn't tell you. In 1982, the New King James reads this way. What are these wounds in your hands? Now, yes... They remove thine, and they put in your, but you have to admit, the prophecy is still there, right? What they didn't tell anybody is that in 1994, a revision came out, a new, a new, a new, new King James. And now, if you get a new New King James, meaning post-1994, it says, what are these wounds between your arms and you just lost the prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Hey guys, you know how to rob somebody and they don't know it? You, you, know, how, you know how guys embezzle? They don't go to work and walk out with uh, $100,000. They walk out with one. And the next day they walk out with another one. Until pretty soon it's all gone. And what these guys do, see, here's what they'll say. They'll say, well, I can still find the prophetic references in other places. Well, we find two places in the New King James you can't find it. Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. And in, in, in New One, uh, the 1994 edition, you can't find it in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6. Correct? And so one by one, one by one, until pretty soon you had two dozen verses for, your, for what you believe, and it's been whittled down to one or two. That is the problem with the New King James. Now, uh, I am going to just show you this and then we'll let you go. This is the New Schofield. The New Schofield version, I call it the New Schofield version because it is a double lie. This book in my hand is a double lie. Remember I told you, <coughs> or I may not have, uh, but, but I always say this, if I can't get past the title page without getting lied to, what am I going to get in here? You say, why do you say it's a lie? Well, several reasons. Number, number one, it says it's a Schofield reference Bible. Authorized King James Version. Has the editor, Dr. C.I. Schofield. That's pretty good. He died 47 years before this. Now that is a really select resurrection. <coughs> I'm going to prove that it's not a King James and it's not a Schofield. Here's what they did. Uh, they, they didn't like words in the text of the King James Bible, so they'd take them out and put them in the middle of the margin in the middle of the page and put their own word in. And every time they did that, in the margin, they put the King James word and they put KJV. Now, I have meticulously marked some places here, because so you've got to get them exact. 
This is uh, page 238 and 239, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and 19. Uh, and on page 238, 1, 2, 3, 4, four times on that page, they changed the text of the King James Bible. I did the math. Four times is the average. In other words, it averages out to four, four times per page. Sometimes it's one or two, um, and, and then sometimes it's up to like 10 or 12. Uh, on the next page, 239, uh, they changed the King James Bible. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. That's 11 times in two pages. How can you change a book 11 times, almost a dozen times in two pages, and claim that's a King James Bible? But I had another place that I meticulously marked. Uh, this is the end of Job and the beginning of Psalms. The end of Job, that is one of the rare times there's no changes on that last page of Job. Uh, in uh, Psalm 1, 1, 2, two times. This is Ezekiel, page uh, 856. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Seven times on page 856. On page 857, two times, two times. Let's see what we've got in New Testament. New Testament, they put the margin on the outside, so I imagine they could remove twice as many. Um, 1334, page 1334, the, new, the, the King James Bible has been changed. One, two, three, four, four times. On page 1335, the new, the new King James changed the King James Bible. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight times. A dozen times in two pages. Guys, guys, when you make four changes per page and then put on the title page, it's a King James Bible, that's a lie. But I also said it's a double lie, didn't I? Blaine, why don't you come on up here and help me? I don't, you don't need your Bible. Um, you can use mine. Uh, here's what I want you to do. Uh, first off, uh, come on up. I am not, not going to set you up. Okay, I just want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, folks. <clears throat> now, the reason I gave Blaine my Bible is because I use an old Schofield. This one is a new Schofield. Now, if you're familiar with the Schofield Bible... Uh, in the verse, if there's a footnote about that verse, down at the bottom it'll have one, two, three, four. Uh, the footnotes are numbered. Uh, I am going to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, I am going to read the footnote in the new Schofield uh, version that is in there. All right, here's what it says. Uh, the verse says, Paul, Paul speaking, he says, For I received of the Lord that which also I, I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Now, look at the verse again, and look at that very carefully, Blaine. Uh, in, in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. Stop. The word that, you see the word that in the verse? Right in front of the word that is a number one, which directs my attention to footnote number one. Here's what the footnote says in the New King James, or the New Schofield Version. Footnote, the Lord's Supper is one of two ordinances or sacraments of the church for this age, the other being water baptism. Do you know what a sacrament is? I told you I was Catholic. You know what a sacrament is? Bestows saving grace. Is there anybody here that believes you're going to heaven because you took the Lord's Supper? All right, Blaine, what does the footnote in the old school field say? It doesn't have it. It doesn't have it. That footnote is not found in an old Schofield. That's not C.I. Schofield's note. But remember this. And whenever you, you hear something bad, always remember this. It gets worse. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And in Acts chapter 8, you, uh, I am absolutely astounded by what takes place. Uh, here's what it says. Now, read, read verse 12. It says, But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, 
and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now, I'm going to read the verse again. Uh, watch it carefully, Blaine. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were... Now, you see the word baptized? In this new Schofield, right in front of the word baptized, is a number two. That's directing my attention to footnote number two. In footnote number two, this is a paragraph that appears. Baptism has, since the apostolic age, been practiced by every major group in the Christian church and in Protestant communions. Now, the standard teaching is, if you're not a Protestant, you're a what? Well, you're a Catholic. You're either a Catholic or a Protestant, right? Whoever wrote that note said, you're either a Christian or a Protestant. But notice it didn't say, it said the Christian church and Protestant communions. It didn't say Protestant churches. You know why? Because the Catholic church does not acknowledge this as a church. You are a bunch of Protestants communing together. The Catholic church is the true church. But it gets worse. Baptism has, since the apostolic age, been practiced by every major group in the Christian church and in Protestant communions. It is recognized as one of two sacraments. Whoever wrote that note believes getting baptized saves you. You believe getting baptized saves you? The other being the Lord's Supper. Since early in the church's history, three different modes of baptism have been used. Aspersion, sprinkling, effusion, pouring, and immersion, dipping. With no book, chapter, and verse, for the, for the pouring and sprinkling. Now guys, that note was written by a Roman Catholic who believes that if you're not a Catholic, if you're a Catholic, you're a Christian, and if you're not a Catholic, you're a Protestant, and there are no, no Protestant churches. Now, we're not Protestant because we never came out of the Catholic church. But they don't recognize this as a church. Blaine, what does the old Schofield note say there? No notes. There is no note. So that is another note that does not appear. All right, thank you very much. Now just, I'm, I'm going to be done but I, gotta, I just got to ask you a question, guys. Did you know that there are mistakes in the Bible? Oh, no. I, I, I have a sermon called Mistakes in the Bible. And, and when I say it, it's mistakes people made. You know, like, this is a mistake. This guy shouldn't have done that. And Like David made a mistake doing that with Bathsheba. No, 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 no. I am talking about flaws, errors, mistakes in the Bible. Did you know that there are mistakes in the Bible? And that they were put there divinely by God. In uh, First Chronicles, it should be page, should be page four seventy three. If this is like mine, yeah. In First Chronicles, chapter eleven, verse eleven, there is a note. And you don't have to go, you don't have to look because uh, there's no note in an old school field. Um, it says uh, it's talking about uh, Jashabim, and it said he lifted up his spear against. 300 slain by him at one time. And in front of the three, there's a note, uh, number two. Listen to this note. This is an, and by the way, this is not found in a Scofield Bible, but it's found in a new Scofield Bible. God gave us the Bible free from error in the original manuscripts. In its preservation through many generations of recopying, he providentially kept it from serious error. Now, the reason I, I, when I read this last night, uh, Miriam and I were having a joke because she broke her neck, and I broke my neck, and she walked around with her neck broke, and I walked around with my neck broke, and I said, I said, Miriam, when they did the surgery on your neck, and, and you woke up, and you said, did everything go okay? How would you feel if they said, well, we didn't make any serious errors? <laughs> you can have open heart surgery. Hey, you ever make any mistakes? Well, nothing serious. You know, I go have uh, neck surgery, and they say, uh, you have any problems? No, nothing serious, but you will be eating out of your right ear now. Um, but wait a minute. What I tell you? I told you it always gets worse, right? God gave us the Bible free from error in the original manuscripts. In its preservation through many generations of recopying, he, capital H, he providentially kept it from serious error. Although he, capital H, God, permitted a few scribal mistakes. That Schofield note says that God put mistakes in the Bible. He allowed mistakes. There's mistakes in the Bible because God put them there. What's well, a divine mistake? And that is not found 
in a, in a Schofield, old Schofield. Now, I'll tell you what I get. I get, the, especially men, I can't get over men, you know. I had some guy go, uh, he had a new Schofield, and he goes, well, I paid 100 bucks for that. I'm, I'm just going to use it, because if I don't, I, I got cheated out of my money. You know what I say? And some of you guys understand exactly what I'm saying. If all you ever get cheated out of in life is 100 bucks, you did pretty good, didn't you? I mean, if, hey, you know what you do? You set aside. I had a guy say this one time. My grandmother gave me that. I have to use it. I said, what would you do if your grandmother gave you a pink mohair sweater? <laughs> you know what you do? You go, oh, grandma, thank you so much. And then you'd go to the bottom drawer of your dresser, you put it in there, and never open it again. So if your grandmother gave you a new, new Schofield reference Bible, you know what you do? You open up that bottom drawer, tuck it under the pink mohair sweater, leave them both there. All right? A Schofield, this book... On the cover page, on the title page, said it's an authorized King James Version. It is not. That's a lie. Said it's a Schofield reference. You saw three notes that are not Schofield's notes. It's a good thing he was dead because he wouldn't allow those. So it's a lie. You say, then why'd they do it? There's only one reason they did it. Well, two. One, money. Two, get something into the hand of somebody. You know how, you know how Miriam got this? She wanted a King James. She wanted a King. She didn't go in there and ask for an NIV. She wanted a King James Bible. You know what they showed her? Look at this man. It's right there. Authorized King James Version. They lied. Well, I, I get so tired of people saying, don't pick on ladies. Well, what do you call that? When you sell a lady, a lady that came in for a Bible, and you sell her a ringer. So, guys, that's not a King James, and that is not a Schofield. That one right there, that's a King James, and that's a Schofield, all right? So, guys, now you know something about the Geneva, about the new King James, and about the Schofield. Preacher. Preacher.